en aquest context. Bon vespre, gràcies per acompanyar-nos. Volem agrair de tot cor al CCCB que hagi comptat amb nosaltres. És un honor ser al costat de la companya Begoña Gómez Urzaiz per tenir aquesta conversa amb Maggio Farrell, una autora a qui admirem tantíssim i de qui defensarem que el seu últim llibre, Hamnet, casa perfectament amb el lema d'aquest any del Festival Cosmopolis, que és la literatura que ve, perquè aquest llibre és la literatura que ve, perquè és tota una revolució. Oi, Begoña? I tant. Moltes gràcies. Encantada d'estar aquí amb la Gemma Ruiz i estem, com has dit, supercontentes d'estar, de compartir escenari, ni que sigui via vídeo, amb Maggio Farrell. Com sabeu tots, si esteu aquí, ella és una escriptora nord-irlandesa, nascuda a Irlanda del Nord, fa molt de temps que és una veu imprescindible de la literatura anglosaxona. És autora de vuit novel·les, d'un llibre memorialístic, un llibre infantil, tots ells gairebé tots traduïts al català i al castellà. Però tot i això, amb aquest últim llibre creiem que ha colpit d'una manera especial i que ha guanyat premis, com el Women's Prize for Fiction i altres premis importants, però també el que és més important, que és tot un seguit de lectors entusiastes, entre els que ens comptem. Totalment, les primeres. Sí, sí, les primeres. Hem de veure un petit vídeo? Sí, perquè acabéssiu de veure la Maggio Farrell i us creieu que avui serà aquí amb nosaltres. Un poc obrir això. T'han posat. Ai, no veus. És ella. Sí, sí. Em sent? Hello. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, that's great. Hello. Hi, Maggie. Welcome. Welcome, Maggie. Hello. Yeah, we're so, so pleased to have you here. We were thinking this is going to be like a chat, but also like a giant book club, because I'm sure a lot of the people here have read the book and they're dying to talk about it. Sure, well, that sounds lovely. I only wish I could be in Barcelona with you all. Yeah, nosaltres ens agradaria també. Molt. Doncs entrem en matèria? Sí, sí, sí. Vinga, doncs el seu últim llibre es titula Hamnet i potser encara no he tingut temps de llegir-lo, correu a fer-ho quan sortiu d'aquí, però segurament, encara que no l'hagueu llegit, és un nom que fàcilment us condueix a un altre, que és Hamlet, la tragèdia de Shakespeare i un dels llibres fundacionals de la literatura universal. Doncs bé, el llibre de la nostra autora podríem dir que és ni més ni menys que la prodigiosa especulació sobre el dolor i la personeta de debò, un nen d'11 anys de nom Hamlet Shakespeare, que inspira i s'amaga al darrere de la dissortada història del jove príncep de Dinamarca que William Shakespeare va escriure cinc anys després de la mort del seu fill. Sí que ens agradaria entrar a la senyora O'Farrell directament demanant-li com va sorgir la idea d'imaginar aquest context, aquest sotabosc que hi podia haver darrere o sota la transcendent obra de William Shakespeare. Well, it's been an idea that's been uh, gestating for quite a long time. I first heard of the existence of Hamlet Shakespeare when I was at school, when I was 16, and I was studying the play Hamlet for my exams, my English literature exams. And I had a really wonderful English teacher at school. I was very lucky in that regard. And he just mentioned in passing one day that Shakespeare had had a son who was called Hamlet and he had died aged 11. Um, we don't know what of his, uh, his, his burial was recorded, but not the cause of his death. But he had died in 1596 and Shakespeare went on, we believe, because it's very hard to date the plays of four or five years later to write the play Hamlet. And I was just, as even as a teenager, I was very struck by the near echo of these names um, and, and just wondered what it meant you know what did it mean for a man as mysterious as Shakespeare because although we have his enormous wealth of work and his plays and his poetry and this enormous wealth um, 
we know actually very little about him. He is quite a mysterious and quite a shadowy figure. There are lots of gaps in his biography that even the best biographers and scholars haven't been able to fill. Um, people refer to the years between him being the Glover's son, the grammar school boy in Stratford-upon-Avon, and then appearing in London quite a long time later as a playwright, as the lost years. They call them the lost years because nobody knows how he made that journey, how he, how he moved from being the Glover's son in Stratford-upon-Avon to being the world's, you know, probably the world's greatest writer. <laughs> um, so, but I think I just, you know, it's always seemed to me that the act of calling, I think anyway, his best play after his dead son, because in the 16th century, spelling was a lot less stable than it is now. So they are the same name. But, you know, it seems to me that scholars have uh, not given Hamnet, the boy, his due. No one has ever uh, recognised him as a very, very important uh, character person in, or, uh, in, in uh, his death has never been given the significance it deserves. You know, I, I read when I was at university where I studied literature, I read scholars saying, well, you know, it's impossible to know whether or not Shakespeare was thinking of his son when he called the play Hamlet, <laughs> which is, is laughable because, you know, what person would take the name of their dead son and give it to the play, to their character, to the ghost, let's not forget. You know, th there's a story that Shakespeare himself took the role of the ghost in the very first production of Hamlet. So, you know, in order to produce that play, he would have had to write his dead son's name over and over again. He would have had to hear it over and over again in rehearsals. He would have had to speak it himself over and over again. And nobody would do that lightly. It could never, ever have been an act that was taken, undertaken casually. So I've always been fascinated by the link between the death of Hamlet and the creation of the play Hamlet. And I wanted to give, I wanted to bring this boy up from being a literary footnote and being forgotten about, largely forgotten about, um, and put to him centre stage and to give him a story and a voice all of his own to say this boy was important, he mattered, he was grieved, he was loved, and without him we wouldn't have Hamlet and we probably wouldn't have Twelfth Night. I attribueix el fet que ara ens sembla inaudit que ningú abans hagués fet aquesta connexió entre Hamlet i Hamlet, que ara ens sembla evident, i el fet que, com vostè deia, s'hagi reduït una cosa tan important com la mort d'un fill, gairebé una nota a peu de pàgina dins de la seva vida, bueno, tenia tres fills, li van quedar dos, sembla inaudit. It is, no, it is unbelievable. I mean, he had three children, he had two daughters and a boy, Hamlet, and Hamlet, like I said, died at the age of 11. His daughters went on to live incredibly long lives, both Judith and Susanna. Susanna lived until her 60s and Judith lived until her early 70s which in that day and age was extraordinary because the, the life expectancy was 47. So that just gives you some idea of how long they lived, you know, how long their life was. I don't really know why uh, Hamlet has been so ignored and forgotten. I think there are lots of reasons. And I think one of the things that continues to intrigue us about Shakespeare is that his plays are open to so many interpretations, you know, and I think there has been certain fashions or times in literary criticism and scholarship where uh, people have been encouraged, students who have been encouraged to ignore a writer's biography. Certainly when I was at university in the early 1990s, that was very much the trend. We were, we were not taught anything about Shakespeare's life and we were encouraged to not even think about it. We had to think about, you know, uh, the sort of critical, we had to think about post-Marxist readings, uh, post-structuralist readings, you know, it was all very focused on literary theory rather but you know a biography there's not that there's anything wrong with that you know obviously I think literary criticism is a very valid, <laughs> valid discipline but I think it's you know for me it's always been impossible to ignore the idea that you know that Shakespeare himself I mean I think I think what it boils down to for me is that Shakespeare as I was saying is a very shadowy figure you know there is there's so he left a very very scant account of himself, a very scant paper trail, the documents that pertain to Shakespeare are very few, if you, in contrast with his father, who has an awful lot. And um, we only have six examples of Shakespeare's signature, um, for example, you know, so, and the only reason we have uh, his plays, the only reason his plays uh, were preserved was because his friends and colleagues uh, 
published them after he was after he died. So Shakespeare himself didn't bother to preserve his own work before he died. And he had quite a long retirement. It wasn't as if he didn't have time to do that. <laughs> so uh, that intrigued me because I think, did he not know his own worth? Did he not realise what his plays were? Did he not realise his own genius? Which is an intriguing question. But there are many intriguing questions about Shakespeare. But I think what the idea of Hamnet and Hamlet boils down to for me, the fascination for me has been that I think, you know, given that Shakespeare is a very mysterious person, it's always seemed to me that in the act, that very simple act of taking the name of his dead son and giving it to this play and echoing the name and splitting it between father and son, of course, in the play, Shakespeare becomes, in that act, Shakespeare becomes briefly visible to us as a human being. We can see him briefly as a grieving father, as a man, as somebody who's heartbroken. Jo vivia fins i tot amb, amb certa por de que algú pogués tenir aquesta idea, perquè vostè va tenir aquesta espurna d'idea quan era molt jove, com, com ens ha explicat des de l'Institut. Que algun altre novel·lista pogués sortir yes. amb això? Si tenim problemes amb la col·lecció... Jo crec que el son no l'hem perdut. No, mira, ja torna a ser aquí. No. no. Tots hem viscut això bastant aquest any. <ríe> es veu moviment, eh, per això? Es veu un moviment, però no se sent. Ens han dit que no era molt bona la connexió. No. Yeah, I can hear you. Ah, ah no, d'acord. <ríe> We can hear you now. Potser no s'entiu. I can hear you. <ríe> vale. I can hear you, but I didn't hear the question, I'm sorry. Ah, sí. Ah, dèiem si... si... Com que vostè va tenir aquesta primera espurna, Hamlet, Hamlet, estan fins i tot a l'Institut, i, i, però han tardat molt en desenvolupar aquesta idea en una novel·la, no tenia certa por que algú li pogués prendre? És que ens sembla tan brillant que pensem que era que... tant que ningú no l'hagués robat Exacte. aquesta idea. It was something I worried about, it's true. I mean, to be, to be very honest, I, it wasn't as if at the age of 16, I decided to write a novel about, yeah. <laughs> about oh, Hamlet. God. I was quite a long way off from being a novelist at that yeah. point. But it was an idea that certainly um, stuck in my head. And I used to think about Hamlet Shakespeare quite a bit. And then I, I was looking back in a notebook of mine and I found an entry from, I think it was 2013. Um, and it was just scribbled in, in the corner of a notebook saying, a novel about William Shakespeare's son, Hamlet. Um, and I, and I, I, at some later date, I had put brackets around it in a different color pen as if to say, this is an idea I need to go back to. Um, so I, it was obviously, but it took me a while to, um, to come around to it. And there were two things that stopped me, that kept um, delaying me, I should say. One of which was just the idea of writing fiction about mm. Shakespeare. <laughs> it seemed, it seemed like a ridiculous idea in a lot of ways. You know, I thought, you know, who, who would do that? You know, who would dare really to go anywhere near him? Who would dare to touch him? Who would dare to inhabit him on, you know, on, fictionally on a page? And also I had a strange superstition about this book because I have a son and two daughters as the Shakespeare's mm. did. Although mine are in a different order, my son is the eldest. And I found that I could not even think about writing this book. I couldn't start writing it until my own son was past the age of 11. Um, because mm -hmm. I think you have to be careful what you write. And I, not that there was a huge risk, obviously, of my son contracting the Black Death, but you never know. You can't yeah. be too careful. <laughs> so I couldn't start it until he was safely past that age. He's now almost 18. He's going to be 18 next week. So hopefully he's, he's, well, past, he's well past that danger. Yeah, exactly. But there was a strange uh, superstition about it. So I had to wait until he was, he was grown. Després tornarem al món de la superstició, senyora Farrell, Farrell però ara voldríem saber si, continuant amb això, no? amb, amb, amb com se li va acudir, com va desenvolupar la idea de la novel·la, si va témer reaccions reaccionàries, valgui la redundància, o si n'hi ha hagut perquè s'atreveix, i, i amb, amb tota la valentia literària, d'anar a l'arrel, al cor de la mateixa tragèdia de, de tot un Hamlet. Vull dir que els experts shakespearians Uh, alguna cosa a dir sobre la seva magnífica especulació? S'han posat nerviosos? No? Perhaps. I mean, to be honest, I don't really read 
my reviews not really for that reason just for other reasons I don't think it's very good for a writer to see themselves from the outside so I haven't read the reviews I was very very nervous when I heard that the American scholar Stephen Greenblatt um, was going to write a review of Hamlet in the New York Times so I was really worried because he, he, Stephen Greenblatt if you've read the book he, he's some of his words are create a form the epilogue of the novel so I was terrified but luckily he was very kind to me <laughs> so but the thing about you know I think the um <clears throat> I think it's always seemed to me that the thing about Shakespeare is that there is a a huge amount of capacity and space for all kinds of different interpretations you know particularly Hamlet actually the, you know there have been so many interpretations and angles and views of it and I think there's room enough in the world in everybody's heads to accept many, many multiple interpretations. That that is actually what is endless. Like I was saying, is endlessly fascinating about Shakespeare. You know, you can view it in so many different ways through so many different lenses. So, I believe anyway that there are that there's room for all of us to have many, many different opinions on it. Però els biògrafs tradicionalment no han estat gens amables amb amb Anne Agnes Hathaway. En això sí que han estat d'acord. En en well, yeah, that's, the thing. that's the thing I um, was very cross actually with a lot of Shakespearean scholars about because I originally conceived the book to be about fathers and sons and about ghosts and absence as of course the play is. That was my initial plan. Um, but when I was doing my research for the book, I got really infuriated and quite angry actually about how Hamlet's mother has been treated by uh, scholars and biographers and other writers actually and script writers of Oscar winning screenplays. I was so furious about the way they attacked her and represented her. You know, we, I don't know how she's viewed in Spain, but um, certainly in this country, we've only ever been taught one single narrative about her. And that is that she was an older peasant woman who lured this boy genius into marriage at a very young age. That he that she trapped him by getting pregnant, that she, he hated her, that he had to run away to London for, to get away from her, that he regretted marrying her, and it, you know it, it goes on and on and on, and you can mm -hmm. find you know very respected Shakespeareans writing things like you know she was ugly, she had loose morals. It's questionable whether Susanna the baby it was Williams, you know William Shakespeare absolutely dropped because I didn't know where this was coming from, and I haven't been able to find. A single shred of evidence for any of it at all. Um, there's no evidence at all that he hated it. There's no evidence that he had to run away to London to get away from her. And that you know the the slurs on her appearance and her and her morality are just completely baseless. There's one um, single portrait of her in existence, which is a pencil sketch, and in it she actually is is she's got this very narrow face with high cheekbones, quite quite a serious expression. She actually looks very like the actress Saoirse Ronan who I think most people can agree is pretty far from being ugly. Yeah. But, you know, and people will always invoke the famous second best bed behest that Shakespeare leaves her in his will. But what her detractors never ever mentioned is that that, that behest is actually an interlineation. It's squeezed in between two other very narrow lines in the will. And the will in itself, you know, people have made so much about how he only leaves her a bed and that he doesn't show her any affection. But actually the will is a very dry document and there's no affection showed for any of the people in his will. I mean, you know, the man was dying, let's not forget, when he wrote this document. And you would never think that the person who wrote the will is the same person who wrote perhaps the best lines ever about love in all its many forms. But what people never mentioned is, of course, that by law at the time, she was, his wife was entitled to a third of his estate. And when Shakespeare died, he was the equivalent of a multimillionaire. He was incredibly wealthy. He'd made a vast amount of money on the stage through his productions. And um, he, he also invested it very, very wisely. He was clearly a very good businessman, but he'd invested all the money he'd sent, he, he earned in London, he sent back to Stratford-upon-Avon. So even at the end of his career, he lived in what, single room lodgings in London, but in Stratford, he owned a mansion of a house that he bought for his wife and daughters after Hamlet died. He owned cottages, he bought fields, he bought land and he rented it all out. So, you know, for me, it's very clear from just that one tiny fact it, that his heart was in Stratford-upon-Avon. And also when he retired, he went back to Stratford-upon-Avon to live with his wife. And that is not the act of a man who regretted his marriage and hated his wife. But uh, you know, to, to go back to the will, she was entitled to a third of his estate and she was allowed by law to live on in the house until her death. 
So the idea that she was this rejected wife thrown out on the pavement with just a bed to her name is, is ridiculous <laughs> and it's completely erroneous. And I think the most, the sort of big lightning bolt moment for me researching her was reading her father's will. So her father, Richard Hathaway, was a very successful sheep farmer and he died a year before she married William. And in his will, he leaves her a very generous dowry and he refers to her as my daughter, Agnes. Um, and that absolutely gobsmacked me because I had never heard that that, I'd always known her as Anne Hathaway. That's what everybody calls her in, in every sort of document and every sort of book about Shakespeare, you'll see that. But, you know, you'd think if anyone knows her real name, surely it would be her father. <laughs> and her father being a sheep father, and Agnes is of course Latin for lamb. And so I just, it was a sort of astonishing moment. And I thought, you know, it seems so emblematic to me because on top that she, all this hatred and disapproval and lies that had been heaped upon her in the last 400 years since she died. On top of that, we've been calling her by the wrong name. So I wanted to give her back that name. I wanted to use the name her father gave her um, as a sign, as a signal to the reader that this is somebody you haven't yet met. You know, I wanted readers to forget everything they think they know about her and open themselves up to a new interpretation that perhaps they did love each other, that their marriage was a partnership and they loved each other till the end of their lives. Eh, hem començat aquesta conversa dient bueno, la nostra hipòtesi per què creiem que aquest llibre és molt revolucionari eh, i ara us ho explicarem per què. Un dels motius és perquè, perquè creiem que fa èpica de la vida domèstica, que és una cosa que tradicionalment no, no s'ha fet. Ella ha mencionat ara aquestes cases, no? hi ha tres cases molt importants a la, a la novel·la on viu l'Agnes eh, i moltes de les escenes succeeixen sota el sostre d'aquesta casa i són escenes domèstiques i escenes familiars i per tant posa el pes i posa en el centre eh, els personatges que normalment no, no ho estan. I el segon motiu que a nosaltres ens fa sostenir que aquest llibre és una revolució és que mm, aquesta versió, aquesta visió, interpretació que fa Mario Farrell de, de Hamlet eh, fa que quan, quan tu te'l llegeixis hem fet l'exercici no? de llegir-nos un altre cop uh -huh. Hamlet i dius és que no et pots treure del cap aquesta interpretació. Per tant, amb una novel·la contemporània, eh, Mario Farrell aconsegueix eh, canviar el, sen resignificar el sentit, totalment. resignificar el sentit d'una tragèdia universal i com a universal quasi bé inamovible, no? li canvia uh -huh. el sentit més profund. I per tant, aquest era el nostre diagnòstic. No sé què creurà Mario Farrell de <ríe> no sé què pensar pensa. que... Hamnet és una revolució de llibre. <laughs> well, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. <laughs> ask that question. I don't know. I mean, I think all I can say really is that um, it's a book I wanted to write for a really long time. And it's always seemed, I think I was um, motivated by the idea that he's never been given his dues, that little Hamnet has been forgotten about and not enough people know about him. He's mentioned very briefly in James Joyce's Ulysses. But apart from that, you know, I was amazed. And I asked friends of mine who, like me, were students of English literature. And I've said to them, you know, do you know what Shakespeare's children were called? And they all said, no, I've no idea. And I said to them, when I was thinking about writing the book, I said, well, you know, his, he had a son called Hamnet. And several people said to me, you know, you can't make that up. You know, you can't lie about that line Shakespeare. And I said, no, 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 it's true. I promise you, there is a line in the... So I just felt, uh, you know, fuel, the fuel for the book but for me was wanting to tell people about this boy that um, is so, who's so important. And also, you know, think about his death as a lens through which to view the play. Because if you think about, if you consider the boy who died aged 11 mm -hmm. and you look at the play through those eyes, um, you know, it's always seemed to me very, very clear that the play is a message from a father in one realm. Get that the, in the play, Hamlet, the name is split between father and son and the father is the ghost and the son is alive and the son is an adolescence, is an adolescent um, as Hamlet would have been at the time that Shakespeare wrote it. So it's, it's more than tempting for me to, you know, it doesn't take a psychiatrist to see what Shakespeare is doing there. You know, he, he is taking on his son's death and he is allowing his son to live through the play. That's the purpose of the play, I think. That's the purpose of Shakespeare writing it. That's his, his interpretation. He's wanting his son to live and he's taking the death. And I think, you know, I think the play Hamlet is a very interesting one because I think there are 
I think in that play more than any other, Shakespeare, the human, Shakespeare, the man is visible to us. You know, there's one scene in particular where um, it's a scene where Hamlet is talking to the players who are about to perform the play that he has written, the play to catch the king, to catch the conscience of the king. And there's an astonishing speech where Hamlet tells the actors how to speak his lines. And he said, you need to speak them trippingly off the tongue. And when you read that scene, you get, I, I anyway get this, the hairs on the back of my neck rise up because I think there he is, there's William, you know, that's him talking to his players. And I find it an astonishing speech and it's quite, it's very brief and you know, the play moves on, you know, at quite a pace, but there's just that odd moment where you think that's him, that's him talking. And there's also the scene, which I, is a speech which I find almost actually unbearable to read. And it's the speech where the ghost is describing to Hamlet um, the manner of his death. And he, if, if you've read the play, you'll remember that he describes um, lying in the orchard asleep and his brother, of course, comes along and pours poison into his ear. Um, and he describes the poison coursing through his body and he describes it going through the gateways and alleyways of his blood and his body. And he describes the agony of it. And he says, it's horrible, horrible, most horrible, the physical sort of sheer pain of his death. And, you know, I really hope that 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 speech is fiction. I hope that Shakespeare made it up, but I don't think he did. I read that speech and it brings to mind <clears throat> um, contemporary accounts of watching people die of the Black Death. And I have a horrible, horrible feeling uh, in my bones that that is Shakespeare watching Hamlet die. Tant. Uh, hi, ha un, hi ha una altra decisió subversiva que, que vostè va prendre, que és negar-li el nom a, a William Shakespeare, que en cap moment té nom, sempre es refereix a ell com el preceptor de llatí, el germà, el marit, que són referències al lloc que ocupa a la vida de, de les dones, de la, de la seva vida. Eh, entenem que això estava clar des del principi, que en cap lloc, ni tan sols a la contraportada, el lloc sortiria que hagués servit per vendre més llibres, més llibres potser però que el lloc havia de sortir el nom de Shakespeare, per què havia de ser així? Well, I always felt I needed to, if you are going to write fiction about real people, even if those real people died almost half a millennia ago, you have to honor that and you have to be careful and you have to always bear in mind for yourself and for your readers that you know, the people on your page, on the page of the novel, are fiction. You know, they might, they might bear a huge resemblance or as much resemblance as you can, or they might share the names with those real people. But you have to remember that those people are real and you have to be respectful of that. So in a way, I wanted to not use the name Shakespeare for any of them. So none of them are given a surname at all as a, as a mark of respect, because those, you know, the the bones of those people are still in the churchyard in Stratford-upon-Avon and mm. it felt too presumptuous for me to assume their entire identity and say these people are mine this I'm going to put them on the page so yes I have taken all the biographical details I could find and I've taken their houses and their streets and their first names but I felt that I needed to leave their whole names out of respect for them but in terms of the name William Shakespeare, <laughs> there were many reasons why I, it doesn't appear in a book at all. So he never appears, like you say, as William or Will or anything. Because, I mean, partly because, you know, for me, a, a lot of the book is about names. The, the novel addresses the idea of names and what they mean to us and our connection with them and also how they can become separated from us, in a sense, just like Hamlet is separated from Hamlet. And in a sense, you know, the name, the two words, William Shakespeare, have become separate from the human being that he was I think you know his name is, is, is the name of an icon now isn't it the name of a whole way of looking at the world he's is the name of a language in a sense um and everybody in everybody has their own relationship with William Shakespeare inside their head we all have our own vision of him and our own relationship with his words <clears throat> and his characters so in a sense I needed to um I need to divorce him from the name. I needed to take him the name away from him because I wanted people to see him as a human being, not as a literary icon. So that was, those were the reasons why, but there was also the very simple reason for me in a technical sense, I found it possible to write a sentence with his name in it and sentence of fiction. You know, I couldn't write a sentence like, 
William Shakespeare ate his dinner. <laughs> it, just, it just sounded ridiculous, you know, and as soon as I, I tried to write it, I found myself just pulled up out of the world of the book. And I thought, well, if I, as the writer, can't stay submerged in this narrative, I can't expect my readers to. So I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to take the name. I just wanted to get rid of it altogether because I found it distracting and I thought my readers would find it distracting. Um, so I just decided to avoid it to sort of um, bend the novel around the fact that he wasn't going to have a name at all because to call him William seemed really presumptuous. You know, how dare I? It's presumptuous. So I just thought, I'd... yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it just didn't seem right. So I just decided not to use it at all. And I because I want, I wanted people to see him as a person uh, rather than the genius that we all know him to be. I wanted them to see the person. I wanted to see them. I wanted them to see the William before he became William Shakespeare, in a sense. Anem a la que sí que té nom, que és Agnes, que és la, la gran protagonista d'aquesta mm -hmm. novel·la. I aquest any el Festival Cosmópolis eh, vol indagar especialment en allò que hi ha de sobrenatural en el món i en les natures humanes, també, diguem. Per tant, ens agradaria saber en quin moment va decidir que l'Agnes eh, seria la protagonista absoluta i sobre qui orbitaria tota la novel·la. I també ens agradaria eh, saber com és que la va imaginar amb aquests dons, amb aquesta connexió amb els... Amb els sabers ancestrals i, i amb aquesta capacitat de, de, de llegir més enllà dels ulls de les persones. I mean, I think there wasn't really a point at which I decided she would be the main focus of the book. It was just something that um, became engendered by the way I wanted to write it. So it was always important to me to write uh, to write the story behind the story we all know. So, you know, we all know about this incredible boy genius who came from this small market town in England, the son of a glover, and that he made it to London. And he had this astonishing career that we still know about now. You know, we still have the work that he did then. But it's always, you know, ever since I heard about the existence of Little Hamnet when I was 16 in my classroom in Scotland, um, it's always seemed to me that the biggest act or the biggest drama in the sense of Shakespeare's life happened off stage and that's back in Stratford-upon-Avon. You know, I mean, I do realise that there's a very valid reason why most novels or films or biographies or works of scholarship about Shakespeare will focus on his career in London. I, you know, I understand why that is because obviously that's where, that's where the big story happened. But I'm interested in the, the story we don't know about, the story is in the shadows in the sense or off stage um from that one you know because i think nobody i think really has ever before really delved into his domestic life and delved into his family um i mean certainly his wife and children they've always been very much in the shadows no one's been really that interested in them which i i find really baffling because they've always interested me i suppose so i wanted in a sense to put them center stage and that's why their father is actually uh, you know, he's, he's not a main character, particularly because actually he wasn't there. He wasn't geographically in Stratford. He was in London, as we all know, working. Um, so in a sense, you know, when, I mean, there's a document proving that when Hamlet died, Shakespeare himself was on tour with his company in Kent, just outside London. Um, so it's not actually even known whether or not he made it back to Stratford to attend Hamlet's funeral, which is really heartbreaking to think about. But we know that he was on tour because there, there is a playbill that exists from that time, from August 1596. Um, but in a sense, you know, I wanted to tell the story, like I said, that isn't the story we already know and the story that's largely undocumented. You know, there's so much research, obviously, into Shakespeare and his career on the stage and his writing. But the lives of his children and his wife and his, the rest of his family, because of course they all, his children and his wife lived in a household with Shakespeare's parents and a lot of his brothers and sisters. So they all lived in a sort of large extended household. And those lives aren't really documented. We don't know much about them. And that was what intrigued me. You know, I wanted to know, I wanted to know that. That was the thing that, that intrigued me. And I wanted, you know, and also it was in a sense, I wanted to um, rehabilitate the figure of his wife, you know, to give her, uh, an identity and to suggest that their marriage was uh, a partnership and they had a kind of exchange of artistry. You know, people have vilified her for years, the fact that she was illiterate, you know, and how terrible it is that this genius, this literary genius was married to an illiterate woman. And, you know, she probably was illiterate actually, because what daughter of a sheep farmer in 
1500s would have been taught to read what purpose would that have served really for her but you know it doesn't it's it's almost too obvious to say that being illiterate doesn't necessarily mean you are stupid which is something else that has been, has been thrown at her more mud to, to fling at her you know there are other types of intelligence as we all know there are other types of skill and so i wanted i was just in terms of building up her character um there were sort of two things at play and then the sense and both those come from shakespeare's work so um, you know, I, I wanted to, the idea that she had her own kind of intelligence and there's something in, you know, one of the things that has always fascinated people and continues to fascinate us about Shakespeare as a writer is that he always displays an incredible breadth of knowledge in his metaphors and, you know, he seems to know a huge amount about an enormous number of things. <laughs> and one of the things that um, I drew from the play Hamlet is um, he uses a lot of um, knowledge of herbology, of plant medicine. So I'm thinking about the scene with the mad Ophelia when she hands people's she hands people plants and all the plants that she gives them are a very specific remedy for a flaw that she perceives in their character. So it's very clear from that scene that Shakespeare knew what he was talking about. That he was writing from a from a standpoint of, of a very informed standpoint. And I read that um, in several places that it would have been the woman of the household that had that knowledge that every household would have grown their own medicinal garden. And the woman, the mother, or the, the mother figure would have, would have would have been the one to use those plants for minor ailments. And so I just decided to give that to her because I thought I was just imagining a scene where Shakespeare was trying to write the Madophilia scene and saying, you know, what do we use rue for? What do we use rosemary for? Why do we have lavender? <laughs> and she would tell him, you know, so I and um so the other thing that she has is, which again I drew from his uh there's an awful lot of metaphors about falconry and hawking um, in, in Hamlet and also in The Taming of the Shrew. So I decided to give that expertise to her. But in terms of Agnes's um, second sight or um, psychic powers, which are, are sort of, I hope are gently alluded to. So she believes she has them and there are others in the town who don't believe she has them. But again, that's drawn from the plays. You know, there's an awful lot of uh, sorcery and augury and second sight in his plays, you know, Macbeth, for example, and Julius Caesar. And also I do, think that although you know society in England at that time was very strict uh, particularly about religion you had to attend church once a week it was against the law not to and you could be summoned to court if you didn't attend in fact Shakespeare's father was John Shakespeare was that happened to him twice um, and of course it was completely illegal to be Catholic you you know he had to be a Protestant um, and there are, I've read interesting rumours about whether or not Shakespeare's family was secretly Catholic and also the Hathaways were possibly secretly Catholic. There's no record of William and Agnes's marriage anywhere, which some scholars claim that it's because they were married secretly by a Catholic priest, which is, it's, it's open to much, much interpretation. But I, you know, I, did, I, I just think that in that society, despite it being so strict and, you know, forcibly religious, um, I think there was probably room underneath that for an awful lot of secret belief, um, sort of under the wire that people probably, and I think people were at that time much more closely allied to the natural world and the natural seasons and the cycles, and probably probably quite a lot of paganism and superstition. So I just uh, tried to feed that into the novel as much as I could. Sobre aquests elements paganístics, com deia, i, i sobrenaturals, sabem que quan, quan escriu vostè té un objecte a la taula, a l'escriptori, que d'alguna manera li frena d'escriure aquest tipus de coses, és eh, que sí? Que l'ha tingut amagat temps, però durant Hamlet no, oi? Eh? És així, Begonya? Sí. Bueno, imaginem que el devia amagar per, per escriure Hamlet. I can't show you right now because I'm not sitting at my desk, but I do have... In fact, I had quite a few talismanic objects when I was writing uh, Hamlet. I had a kestrel feather, which I kept on my pin board, and I had quite a number of things that I had. I went on archaeological digs along the River Thames in London, particularly in places that uh, sort of where the Tudor uh, city had been. I did one dig just where the original Globe Theatre would have been, and I found loads of brass pins, which were used to... Uh, fix people their collars that they wore and fix their hair so i really like to think that those brass pins were used perhaps in productions at the globe so i kept i've always i still have those in a dish somewhere in my house but i think what you might be referring to is a <laughs> a cast of my husband's teeth <laughs> so my husband is, is also a writer and he <laughs> and he uh, he's always my first reader so whenever i write a book he'll always read the first draft and he he's very 
honest with me sometimes a little bit too honest <laughs> so i do have and he, a few years ago he's quite sporty he likes to play sport and he had one of those uh casts a gum shield made for playing football and so and he had the cast of his teeth made the dentist made it and then he was about to throw out the cast and i said can i have it <laughs> and so i have it on my desk and <laughs> <laughs> if I ever write a line where I think, oh, this is very beautiful. My metaphor is so wonderful. Occasionally I look across at the teeth and think, he's going to hate it. He's gonna <laughs> cut it. So it reminds me to be, <laughs> it reminds me to be severe with myself. <laughs> Sobre com fer servir les experiències viscudes per fer literatura amb visc, 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 a l'anterior llibre ja ens va enlluernar no? aquesta mm -hmm. manera de fer. Però ens agradaria que que expliqués detalls sobre aquest hort isabelí que va plantar per uh -huh. estar més a prop d'aquests sabers naturals que podia desenvolupar l'Agnès a la novel·la, les arts remeieres, a sobre domesticar també un xoriguer. Uh -huh. I també volíem saber si els seus parts van ser, els seus parts, els naixements dels seus fills, una bona font d'informació eh, i vivència per poder escriure un dels parts més exuberants que s'han escrit a la història de la literatura. Mm -hmm. Digues, Begoña, el que t'han dit alguns homes sobre aquest part. Ah, sí, bueno, mon pana, concretament, em va dir, em sento com si estigués de part jo mateix. T'ha aconseguit sí, una cosa bastant inaudita. Que un home sentís dolors de part, imagini. Well, I wanted, I mean, obviously, a lot of the research for the book was library-based. You know, there's no shortage of books written about Shakespeare, and I did need to do an awful lot of reading. But in terms certainly of the particular the characters of the female, the women in the book, I felt that the research, that there isn't much written about them. They are pretty much undocumented and their lives were undocumented. So I, they required a different type of research. And it was much more hands-on, much more physical what I did to try and inhabit them as people. Um, so one of the things I did was after having read about the idea that it was the woman of the house that had that grew in a, a medicinal garden i decided to grow my own elizabethan medicinal garden so i got a book from elizabethan times and i read about all the different plants that they would have had and the design of these gardens and i planted my own garden <laughs> and i'm not i'm not really very horticultural at, at all um but i did do it and I, so and i still have it actually i still keep it up i still keep it uh, weeded and up to date and then i went on a course to learn about how you um, make medicines from these plants because you know there's only so much you can learn from a book you know i can read a sentence that says you know elizabethans used comfrey for aching joints you know they use lung work to clear but until you actually grow the plants and dry them and then uh, steep them in oil. You don't really, you can't really understand that experience until you actually get your hands dirty. And the other thing I did, which was the most fun thing I've ever done in the name of research was I learnt falconry, I learnt to fly a kestrel. So I went down to the Scottish borders and I met this very wow. cool hawker, a hawker, a falconer, <laughs> uh, a girl, a woman, a young woman, and she let me fly her kestrel. She also had, um, a golden eagle which i flew and i was, I was absolutely terrified of it. it was huge 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 about it. and it was really it would landed on your glove but the point is you know to do that i had to do that because i before i went to visit this falconer i had written a scene in which agnes flies her kestrel and i had described the kestrel landing on the glove with a thud and then when i went to the wood and i flew this kestrel i realized that kestrels are about the size of a kitten. They're incredibly light <laughs> and very, very silent birds. They depart your glove and then they land your glove without you really noticing them. One minute they're not there and the next minute they're there. And, you know, and, and unless I'd actually done that, unless I'd worn that glove and felt the kestrel land upon me, I wouldn't have known that, I wouldn't have known how to describe it properly. So as soon as I drove back from meeting this falconer, I had to rewrite the whole scene and take out the idea that this kestrel was weighty and he would end with a thud. Respecte als parts, que també els comentàvem, no sé si esperem que, no, que, no tinc, que els seus parts no, no fossin com el que es descriu al llibre. Well, I mean, actually, I think Agnes probably had quite, you know, an easy labor. Actually, I mean, I, I have to say, I did not give birth in a wood. I would have quite liked to, actually, but um, no, I was in a hospital all three times, I'm afraid. But uh, I was just imagining what it would be like, you know, because I think especially someone like Agnes, who had grown up on a sheep farm, I think 
Labour would have been much more familiar to them actually than it is to us these days. I think these days it's so uh, medicalized that actually we don't, you know, when we come to give birth, we have no experience of it. Most of us, the first time, you know, I think in those days, a girl would have probably seen her mother in labour or an aunt or somebody in the village. It would have been a much more familiar experience to them, I hope anyway. But obviously it was a lot more, um, it was a very, very dangerous thing to do in the 16th century. You know, it's, I was looking at some of the statistics of the women who, you know, the, the instances of women dying in labor. And I mean, it must've been absolutely terrifying. There was something like a one in five chance that you wouldn't survive. Just unthinkable to us now. Yeah, final, oi, Begoña? Sí? Sembla que sí. Sí, sí, sí. Arribem al final i ja sabem que dels llibres no se n'ha de dir res del final, però és que no me'n puc estar. De parlar d'aquest Hamlet, no? Sí, explica-li una mica a la Màgia Ferrer, que em fa una mica de vergonya dir per què. Sí, bueno, tothom, segurament molta gent ja ho sap, aquí jo crec que la Gemma deu ser la persona de Catalunya i probablement una de les persones d'Europa que més representacions de Hamlet ha vist. Ja he vist Hamlet despullats, Hamlet on ice, Hamlet sobre patins, perquè durant molts anys ha cobert la secció d'espectacles per la televisió catalana. Per tant, per tu ho deies, ha estat molt especial aquesta escena. Sí, jo, el meu cor de teatrera sap que parla en nom de tots els que estimem el teatre i avui no podia passar per agrair-li a Maggio Farrell que ens hagi regalat aquesta cavalcada emocional del final, que ens hagi regalat transportar-nos a la nit d'estrena de Hamlet al Globe amb Shakespeare i la seva companyia. Això és una de les escenes més memorables, inoblidable, i la gent que som teatreros i teatreres li agraïm moltíssim i això li havia de dir. Gràcies per molt. Estic molt, molt feliç that you enjoyed it. And I, I can say that if you, if at any point any of you come to London again, when we're allowed, uh, the Globe Theatre is open because of course it's open air. So it's one of the theatres that's open in London. I'm so excited. It's been so long since I've seen any live theatre. I can't wait. No sé si l'hem pogut sentir bé, que està obert el Globe, que hi ha representacions, eh? No, no, que està open air, vull dir que sí, que s'hi pot anar... A l'aire lliure i que... Sí, és Covid-friendly, no? És open air, and it's all... Sí, és open air, and it's all socially distanced, so there are two seats between one household, and... Yeah, so I'm going to take my daughter, who's just turned 12, to see The Tempest. She's never seen any Shakespeare for ever before, so... Yeah, I'm going in July, so I, I'm fingers oh. crossed that the lockdown doesn't come again and it gets closed again. Sí, ha de ser molt especial, que bé, fantàstic. Doncs potser que passem... Sí, ens queda poquet, però si algú té alguna qüestió per demanar-li... Sí, moltíssimes gràcies. Obriríem el micròfon, no?, per si algú té alguna... Sí, obrirem el micro per si algú té una pregunta. Si algú té alguna pregunta... Acabaríem d'aprofitar que avui tenim Màgia Farrell entre nosaltres. Crec que hi ha algú... Hola, voldria preguntar-li a la Màgi, a mi Hamlet, entre moltes altres coses, m'ha semblat una obra mestra sobre el dol i sobre la mort d'un fill. Jo crec que ens ha fet plorar, derramar llàgrimes per la mort d'un nen de fa segles. I m'agradaria saber com es va enfrontar amb l'experiència d'escriptura del dol de Hamlet, de l'Agnès i del Xespe, també. It was hard, I have to say, and I think the scenes, the two scenes at the centre of the book, firstly where Hamlet dies and then his mother laying him out for burial, I think in a sense were the hardest I've written, not so much in a technical way, um, visit to write them, you know, and I, I was dreading it, you know, and I, you know, because in writing the first half of the book, bringing Hamlet to life, that was always my purpose. I wanted to bring him to life and to give him a voice to say to people, you know, this child existed, please, you know, know about him. Um, and then, of course, I had to kill him in a sense. And that was awful because I had become so fond of him and there also is 
quite a lot of my own son in Hamlet, perhaps not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was really, you know, I hated it. I hated having to put myself inside the skin of a woman who was forced to watch her son die. You know, it's, and it is, you know, it goes with that saying that it's every parent's most visceral fear that that would happen. It's the most awful thing that you could ever imagine happening. So I had to, I found actually that I couldn't write those scenes in my house where I live with my children. I had to write them in the garden. So I wrote them in a shed. Um, it wasn't a nice, you know, uh, writing shed. It was a really horrible garden shed that has actually since blown down in a gale. So I sat in there and I, I would do it in about 10 or 15 minutes bursts. And then I would have to get up and walk around the garden and I would come back and write it again. Wow. So, but in a way I, I wanted it to be heartbreaking and I wanted it to feel really sad because I don't feel that Hamlet's death has ever been given the dignity and the significance that it deserves. You know, you only have to read the opening scenes of Hamlet to understand that this boy was really and deeply grieved. And I think I was so infuriated by so many scholars. You know, Hamlet's lucky really if he gets two mentions in any book about Shakespeare's life and his death is always wrapped up in statistics about child mortality in the 16th century. The implication being that it wasn't really that big of a deal because so many children died, you know, and I just, I've always found that such an outrageous assumption. You know, I, I refuse to believe that anywhere in the world, at any time in the world, no matter how many children are lost, you know, each and every one can be nothing short of a catastrophe for the family. So I wanted his death to feel significant and I wanted to dignify it. So. I know that I, I found the scene, if it's any consolation, I found the scenes very hard to write as well. But I apologise for making you cry. Crec que tenen temps per alguna més? Sí, alguna matxa cada més? Aprofito per dir, perquè hem plorat, però hem plorat de gust, eh? Vull dir, allò que només causen els bons llibres, o sigui, no ens demani disculpes, perquè ha estat una cosa plena. Hello, hello, Maggie. I'm very excited to be talking to you. I've read all your books. I was really excited when you said at the beginning that you weren't only inspired by Hamlet, but by Twelfth Night, too. And did you revive Hamlet by him with Sebastian as well. And you think maybe Shakespeare did. That that was also his well, way the, of well, keeping him alive. Well, the Globe Theatre, who I think is probably the biggest uh, expert, obviously, dates Twelfth Night as the play that Shakespeare wrote after Hamlet. So he wrote it roughly a year or so after Hamlet. And like you say, um, Twelfth Night is a play that features boy and girl twins, which of course Hamlet was. Hamlet had a, a twin sister called Judith, a female twin. Um, and so, so, so of course Twelfth Night features boy and girl twins, like you say, who at the beginning of the play uh, lose each other and they both think the other one is dead. And the play is, is of course a, a mostly played for a comedy. It's a kind of love marriage plot and the boy and girl twin are separated and they disguise each other, they disguise themselves as a boy and girl, they both think the other one is dead, they get mistaken for each other, there's a whole kind of comedy of love and people falling in and out of the, with, in and out of love with the wrong people. And then towards the end of the play, they are magically reunited and they fall into each other's arms. And uh, each say, you know, I, I, I thought you were dead, you know, I thought you were dead, but here you are. And they had, they, he describes them as having the same face all the time. And I, I find that so heartbreaking when you look at it in terms of Shakespeare's own boy and girl twins, Hamlet and Judith. And one of the things that I saw when I was researching the play, I found the original playbill for the original first production of Twelfth Night. And as I was reading it, I kept looking at the date and thinking, I recognize that date. Why, is, why does that date ring a bell? And I realized that the opening night of Twelfth Night for the very first production at the Globe Theater in 1602, I believe, was what would have been the twins' 16th birthday. So Shakespeare chose the date of his opening play, the opening night of his play about boy and girl twins who are separated and then magically reunited uh, as, as what would have been his twin's birthday. And I find that so moving, the idea that obviously the play is a kind of comedy of wish fulfillment for him because all he wants is for his boy and girl twin 
to find each other again and say, we, there was a huge mistake. It was all a mix up. We're still alive and I missed you. Wow. A la novel·la més hi ha aquesta cosa dramàtica que els bessons d'alguna manera s'intercanvien un la mort de l'altre, perquè primer representa que aquesta mort li correspon a la Judit. That's right, yeah. I mean, I, again, that comes from the plays. There is no particular evidence that Judith was ill at the time. I mean, she might well have been or she might not have been. One of the things that interested me about Judith's life, so like I said, Judith lived a really long time. She lived till she was in her early 70s, which for those days was extraordinary. And she married a vintner, who's a wine merchant, or he owned a pub in a sense, uh, who wasn't a very good husband. He was had up, uh, he was, there's evidence that he was the father of other children in the town, unfortunately. But she had three sons with him, um, one of whom died as an infant, and the other two died with each of each other uh, at high summer, so when they were 20 and 21, and then her husband died. So I just got the, <laughs> the life, the life, her life just seemed so awful, you know, to lose all her sons and her husband. But just the idea that she was nursing all these people through illness, it made me wonder whether or not she had had illnesses as a child that gave her an incredibly strong immune system. I don't know. So that was where it came from. And also it comes from the plays, you know, the idea that boy and girl twins, again, is, is a recurring motif in Shakespeare and them being mistaken for each other and losing each other. Um, it was just something that came directly from the plays that I wanted to weave into the book. Tenim temps per una última pregunta? Sí. Doncs va, qui és l'afortunat o l'afortunada? Hola, Magui. Tenim una pregunta de YouTube. Ens pregunten si t'agradaria que la novel·la es convertís en... s'adaptés al teatre i que s'estrenés al mateix teatre de Londres on es va estrenar Hamlet. O en pel·lícula. Te recordes que vam fer una mica de fantasy casting? Nosaltres teníem una aposta de pel·lícula, però potser el teatre seria... Oh, bueno, that would be lovely. <laughs> there are there are plans which I see I'm not allowed to tell you I'm so sorry I have <laughs> lots of strict lawyers telling me <laughs> that I'm not allowed to say a single thing until it's all announced but there are there are plans afoot for that kind of thing but I'm afraid I can't say any more if it was up to no. me I would tell you but I'm not allowed I'll be <laughs> in big trouble if I do Molt bé, però ja aquesta notícia... Sí, jo crec que per donar una bona embranzida a aquests plans, tanquem la sessió saludant com si fóssim al teatre. Ah, sí? Això no m'ho havies dit? Això va... Moltes gràcies. Moltes gràcies. Sí, moltíssimes gràcies per estar aquí. Ha estat un honor poder conversar amb Maria Farrell i moltes gràcies per acompanyar-nos que gaudiu del festival. Sí, sí, la propera en persona. Fa una altra. Vinga. Gràcies. Això m'has pillat.